Um, let's get started talking about City Symposium first. Um, so uh, just to explain quickly what it is uh, or what happened, you can explain more what went behind, what, what was going on behind it and what was the impetus for holding this panel. Mm -hmm. But uh, you yourself and Dr. Melanie Atkins um, held a two hour discussion panel this past, was it two, a week ago? Yeah, yeah last Tuesday. Um, we aired it on the station last Saturday. Thank you very much for uh, a lot giving us your blessing yeah. for doing that. And um, it was, uh, sorry, it was led by a group of mostly London based folks, but people mm -hmm. who even if they were in London right now, um, they actually had made roots in other parts of Canada yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they all had different kinds of backgrounds and different roles to play in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, was that an intentional thing on, on your part and, and Dr. Melanie, Melanie Ann's part mm -hmm. um, to have folks who were, uh, everyone but one person was currently based in London. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, boy was based in, Winnipeg? Calgary. 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 Yeah. Um, but everyone else was based in London. Was that an intentional thing on your part when you were organizing and asking people mm -hmm. to join, to have people who were based in London but had experiences to share from other parts of Canada? Mm -hmm. So initially when, um, I mean, if I could go back um, and share like why we decided to do the city symposium, so kind of bring all of the into the context as well. Mm -hmm. um, but on May 7th, um, I actually spoke at the City Symposium as a uh, guest speaker. Um, mm -hmm. The theme was quality education. Um, and so right before I was actually supposed to speak, um, someone went into the chat room um, and bombarded our chat with horrible words, racist words, right? And it was in bold letters over and over and over again, over 70 times. And I actually recorded it because I'm like, I can't believe this is actually happening. Um, so after, sorry, did you want to? Was it a text? Was it writing in the text or an actual video and them saying it? No, it was a, a writing okay. um, in bold okay. letters. Um, and basically it said, kill all N-words uh, repeatedly. Um, and so Dr. Melanie and I knew that it's either, of course, directed at us. Um, other folks were saying that it might be a bot. And I'm like, regardless, it was written uh, with intention. Exactly. Um, and so after my presentation, or actually Dr. Melanie Ann asked me, do you want to still speak? Because I know this happened right before you're supposed to speak. Do you want to speak or do you want to mm -hmm. um, sit out on this one? Because either way, it's fine. Um, and I told her, I'm like, the what just happened was, intentionally trying to silence us. So for me not to speak would be um, allowing them to win. And mm -hmm. although I know regardless, it would have been fine whether I sat out or not. Um, I just didn't want to in that moment. So I still went through. Um, and Melanie Ann, Dr. Melanie Ann was hosting the whole event um, and still had to smile throughout it all. And so I recognized how much we had to um, perform, right? And how mm -hmm. normal it is for us to perform in order to get by, um, in order to succeed. Um, and so after the event, I think a week or two passed, and I'm like, no, I can't just let this mm -hmm. go by without it being addressed. So I contacted the organizer and asked for um, us to have a, a symposium specifically focused on anti-Black racism. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it came to actually um, selecting speakers, um, I really thought about um, people who I knew who did work um, and anti-Black racism doesn't only affect us in London, Ontario, it affects us globally, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I didn't care where the speakers came from, but um, because I knew many um, great speakers and activists and, and people that do good work in London, um, it just so happened that majority of them were from there. Um, and then I wanted a young, a young Black voice and a young immigrant voice, um, you know, presented. And so Nya Boy was the first person that came to mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. And um, what is what is City Symposium itself? It's an organization? So it's a project. Again, I'm not one of the key organizers, but um, it's a project out of um, Crutchy Center for Health Equity and Research and Innovation, something like that, out of Western. <laughs> um, and 
they actually focus on the sustainable development goals. Um, okay. And that's what they do their talks on. So our confronting anti-black racism was just inserted in there. It's actually not one of the uh, original uh, scheduled symposiums. Um, so yeah, so they focus on sustainable development goals and have speakers that represent different, um, you know, different streams, whether it's an artist, whether it's an activist, whether it's someone who works in civil society, um, and whether it's an academic. And um, they all speak on the work that they're doing within London and globally as well. Okay. Um, what was the, the reaction either in the middle of the initial city, the first city symposium that you were part of, mm -hmm. um, where that incident happened. And what was the reaction either during it or was there any kind of reaction after or outreach to you about what had happened or anything mm -hmm. like that on, on the part of people who are participating, whether as viewers or mm -hmm. panelists or what have you? Yeah. Um, what's crazy is that, you know, when that happened, um, the chat for viewers was actually closed. Um, so this person was able to get into the um, speaker private chat. Mm -hmm. um, so it was only us who were actually speaking that were able to see those messages and the viewers weren't. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And okay. so um, Dr. Melanie, after I presented, Dr. Melanie and did mention, um, you know, this is what I experienced right beforehand. And I thought it was very important. And I was so thankful that she did. Because mm -hmm. I don't think I would have mentioned that that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so she did mention it to the audience uh, for transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, and afterwards, um, we did have a conversation about it. Um, a few folks in the audience who know me contacted me directly to, to ask how I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would have been a bit different, right, if um, everyone saw it, right? And I think that's one of the challenges with um, when discussing race. People don't think it's as bad if they didn't witness it. Um, people don't think it's as bad if, um, you know, they, they themselves weren't the, the perpetrator, right? And so I question that all the time. Um, how come, um, you know, you can't have an understanding if it's not presented right in front of you? And that's one of the challenges that I feel like we experience here in London because people say that, oh, London, uh, racism doesn't exist in London, Ontario. Um, because they didn't hear someone say the N-word, um, mm -hmm. but they recognize it in the organization, they won't hire black people, right? And right. so <laughs> um, it's, it's a really interesting situation. And, and the other thing is that um, it doesn't have to be even as hostile as someone exactly. yelling the N-word, you know, exactly. to your face to make it racism. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, and that's what someone who contacted, like I spoke to, someone who I spoke to about what happened um, said that they didn't reach out because they didn't realize that that's bad. And I was like, really? <laughs> like mm. I, someone said racism, someone, the, the facilitator and the host said that a racist act took place. That's all you needed to hear. You didn't need to know exactly what was said. You didn't need to come uh, draw a line to see how uh, hard or difficult it would be to deal with that particular situation. Um, so when people talk about allyship, that's what I question, right? Mm -hmm. um, what does allyship, allyship look like to you? Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's why I think it's really important to address allyship in the mm -hmm. Confronting Anti-Black Racism Symposium. Yeah, that, that was a question. Um, mm -hmm. There was actually a few questions on allyship that, that were asked. Mm -hmm. One of them was, um, what, you know, what are your thoughts on allyship fatigue yeah. that was forwarded to um, uh, one of the speakers? Yeah. Did you want to say a little something about that? Um, you know what? I, it was interesting. So a lot of the questions um, I had to reword because mm. there was over 400 questions that came in. Um, and many people um, wanted to learn about being an ally, which I thought it was great, right? Okay, um, okay. But at the same time, a lot of them were talking about being tired and how tiring it is to fight for something and being siloed. And, and I was questioning, I'm like, oh my gosh, what do you think we go through every single day? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah. I had to kind of <laughs> compile all of those questions and kind of bring it in. Um, and I understood it as it being allyship fatigue, right? Because many mm -hmm. allies are saying it's, it's very tiring. Um, I don't know what to do next. 
Um, when do I relax? And so, <laughs> yeah, I felt like it was necessary to address it. Um, and in talking about allyship fatigue, it, it was answered very um, strongly, right? Um, mm. It's really questioning um, what your intention is, right? Uh, mm. What's the purpose of you being a part of this movement? Um, and how are you going to use your privilege to, to really be able to support? Yeah, and one of the things that I think um, non-Black folk and especially white folks mm -hmm. need to consider when they want to think about being an ally and what is an ally, it's that <sighs> I, I think it's, it's a hard question for folks who want to help the cause, mm -hmm. who you know, don't believe that they have any strong ingrained racism or who maybe acknowledge it and want to, you know, fight it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's kind of like, what do you expect somebody to do for the, the cause of Black liberation and, and Black mm -hmm. rights if they don't know any Black people, yeah. if they don't have any Black friends? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, if without that close contact, um, it's almost like, or, or this is at least, this is my own personal kind of stream of thought here that I'm sharing yeah. with you. Yeah. But it's almost like there's already kind of this this door of othering that is mm -hmm. entrenched in their own minds that they have to learn how to unlock and open. Mm -hmm. But they're right now they're trying to work on the other side. Yeah. You know, they're trying to do the work of allyship exactly, and exactly, exactly. And I think that's why I was I, I don't know if I mentioned that at the symposium, but um I think I'm, I speak of this often that in order to do this kind of work, in order to even be an ally, you have to recognize the biases and the racism that exists within you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather have you do that than you come along and try to be down to the movement, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was one of my critiques uh, with the protests um, that mm -hmm. happened in London. Um, mm. You know, this, it, it's historical. Nothing like that has ever happened in London, especially when it comes to um, Black lives, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, wow, only 10,000 people came out. And while I was there and I was marching, like, I was just analyzing the environment, right? I'm just trying to understand what it is I'm feeling. I couldn't, rec I, I couldn't come to terms with what I was feeling. Like, it was just a very uncomfortable experience, right? Um, mm -hmm. Having all of these people, a lot of non-Black people, right? Mm -hmm. Marching and saying Black Lives Matter. Some woman brought her daughter in front of us. And you know, I literally got her daughter to say, "I love you." Black Lives Matter, and I'm like, "What is this? Is this a show?" Like I heard mm. people saying it's a parade, and I'm like, mm. you know what I'm saying? Like it was just really uncomfortable for me. And then I questioned, "What are these people going to do after, um, you know, the protest?" Uh, yeah. You know, in yeah. a moment, you know, there's this idea of group think. You know, everyone wants to think alike and be a part of something, but uh, again, it's the intention behind it. Yeah, and uh, um, I, I had a question kind of regarding that, but okay, well, for one thing, um, do you, you're currently based in Toronto, Toronto area, GTA area, yeah, yeah. Um, but you, you did come to London for the march and you have, have spent a long time in London. Have you grown up in London, Dobie Jokey? Yeah, I grew up in London. I've only actually been in GTA since last June for one year. Okay. 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 So, so yeah, you, you, you know, the deal in London. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find that with, you know, that experience that you that you had at the March mm -hmm. and uh, based on your own, you've been doing this kind of work uh, mm -hmm. and, you, and you've been conscious in this way for as long as I've known you, which is not very long, but mm -hmm. from knowing you, I can tell that this is not at all something new that you've taken mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Um, how do you go going off of what you said about how you felt at the march how do you feel about this work that's being done in london um on the topic of allyship but even on on how on the different narratives i mm -hmm. guess is, is one way to put it the different narratives that are leading both um the black lives matter movement and other movements like it in in london mm -hmm. uh and also the response or the reaction or the um not reaction, but the, the willingness to work with this movement on the part of non-Black people and non-Black allies. Like, in other words, how do you feel about the main 
narratives um, kind of circulating that are specific to London mm -hmm. regarding this movement here in the city? Um, it's really, I don't know, it's interesting. Like, I'm really happy the, the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, chapter is being formed because it's so necessary in London. And I'm so proud of those young women who are organizing such a, like, tremendous event. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know there's other groups like uh, Black London Network who are doing mm -hmm. amazing work as well. Um, those spaces are so necessary. Um, and the Black population in London is actually growing. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's a, a lot of people from Toronto, GTA, who are moving to London, right? Um, so having these spaces, having these networks are so important, um, you know, just for security, right? Just to feel safe. Um, but then at, on the other side, right, um, I recognize that after um, the symposium, as well as after the, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, many organizations wanted to have conversations on anti-Black racism or want to have conversations about racism overall. Um, and one of the things I always say is, why now? Because we experience this every single day. Your coworkers have complained, you witnessed it yourself, um, you know what I'm saying? Like, why now? And, and a lot of people are saying it's because of COVID-19, we're all at home, so you know, we're all watching the TV. Someone had mentioned it's because um, George Floyd's death happened and there was a video of it and we're all at home due to COVID-19. I'm like, how many videos have you seen before this, right? And so for me, again, um, I'm happy to know that, you know, there's a level of um, activism, right? Um, and there's a level of uh, interest in becoming more involved and in mm -hmm. supporting um, Black communities. Um, but when we think about systems, right, we have to recognize the, the systemic um, injustices uh, mm -hmm. that take place within our city. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where it starts, right? It's at the root. It's not at, you know, at the surface level. It's at the root. So mm -hmm. until you're able to really um, acknowledge what your organization is doing um, and how it's conflicted uh, to perpetuating um, anti-Black racism, then you can't really be at the forefront. Mm. Um, so that's just, that's how I see it. So why do you think it is right now? Um... <laughs> why, why do I think um, there's well, an interest? There's, there's so many things that are happening, honestly. There's so many things that are happening. Yeah. Yes, there's, there's the widespread... Uh, it's almost like... I was, I, this is what I was saying to a friend of mine a few weeks ago when we were talking about it. I feel that um, for mainly for white folks, this concept of racism and very specifically anti-black racism mm -hmm. and the, the whole you know raison d'etat for black lives matter i think always seemed to be something up for debate in yes. the public eye like the the reason for its existence mm -hmm. which is systemic racism mm -hmm. it always seemed to be at least in america and you know i don't think this conversation was happening to the aggressive nature that it was in canada up until right now mm -hmm. it's happening now which is good but you know just going off of the, the, the start of the movement in the U.S. Uh, and all the things that happened there that caused it, it seemed like this was just something that was always up for debate. And right now, you know, organizations and businesses and corporations and just people, politicians um, who are white are almost like bending to this saying, you know what, you're right. You know, you win the debate. Racism yeah. does exist. Yeah. And um, to, I was kind of just sitting back and looking at that and being like, okay, we've been way, 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 way ahead of this yeah. forever. Yeah. You know, this was almost never really up for debate, you know, mm -hmm. starting 400, 500 years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? That debate was over. Mm -hmm. It was like over before it started. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, why now? Why do you, th what, what's your take on why that's now? Like, that's a big question, right? And I think it's really about tagging on um, a lot of these corporations who, who are, the one that really bothered the crap out of me is looking at the NFL and how they treated Colin Kaepernick and mm -hmm. then the statement they made about police brutality. But they <laughs> relieved this guy of a job. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like the way yeah. the system works is really, um, to prevent, you know, um, a particular group of people 
from reaching success, right? And yeah. so the manipulation um, that happened in that particular context is so disgusting. Um, and I recognize that that's what's also going on in the city of London. Um, and, and, you know, these same people, I don't know everyone personally, right? But I just recognize um, how, let's, let's just say the Catholic school board in London, um, because I've had a horrible experience with the Catholic school board, um, you know, from different educators um, saying racial slurs. Um, my younger brother, when he's in the eighth, seventh and eighth grade, had a horrible principal. Um, she tried to make him go pick two things in the garbage. Um, she told him that you come to, from a, um, a neighborhood that's, that's basically basically saying that he just comes from the hood, right? Um, making all of these assumptions. Um, we actually went um, to speak to the superintendent. They wouldn't let us see the superintendent. We got a call from the principal and she's like, oh, so you tried to see the superintendent? All right, so come, come to the school and we'll have a conversation. Uh, she basically brought a book to me talking about how she's all about social justice and she's not racist um, and that I need to check my, what did she say? Um, oh, I need to check my emotions because I'm too emotional and making everything about race. Um, at that time, there wasn't a, a large advocacy group in London, right? And we're trying to build that right now for the Black community. Mm -hmm. um, and I questioned the Catholic school board's message about Black Lives Matter, because it wasn't only our family that experienced this. There's so many families, um, not only Black families, but immigrant families and other minority groups um, that experience horrible, horrible things through the Catholic school board. And so when things like this are addressed, I question, why aren't you supporting the families directly? It's not about tagging on and, and trying to be part of a cause that you don't really believe in, but mm. what are the system changes that you're actually going to make? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Again, I, I think having conversations with people who, who do this work um, is amazing because I get to learn a lot as well, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and my perspective expands. But as of right now, I'm still trying to understand um, more deeply as to the reason why um, folks really want to be a part of the movement right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, people exist, you know, even in this kind of on a spectrum mm -hmm. where they're coming from, what they already know, how do they feel about it? Mm -hmm. Because one thing that uh, is obviously coming up is that there's a strong polarity, let's just say, you know, and uh, people who are way, way extreme on the other side of this are also becoming kind of vocal and also starting to create narratives that they're feeling victimized. Oh, yeah, exactly. Which is so horrible. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not surprising mm -hmm. for me to see that either. Mm -hmm. But um, I think this is, I really think that this is also a huge, huge part of what white allyship needs to come to terms with and reconcile mm -hmm. with, is that... Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just black folks and indigenous folks and folks of color, other folks of color that are just for whatever reason, you know, not held to the same equal standard in the society and we need to, you know, fix it. And yeah. it's not, it's not only that it's that so much of the systems that are in place, like you were talking about, um, are built on the premise of, of white supremacist principles. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's why. Mm -hmm. This and and that's what I um I think about often, right? And which is why I'm doing my research on on Indigenous African centered education because I not only recognize that African communities have been miseducated and misled, but I also recognize that um, all communities have um, because of the the system that we abide by, um, which mm -hmm. is again built on white supremacy um, and Eurocentric beliefs, right? Um, and is to uphold white supremacy, and many of us do, uh, regardless of what race we are, we are a part of. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the, the major challenges, because most of our learning comes from the education system. Mm -hmm. And so if we're being taught um, to believe certain narratives about communities, and that's what we're going to perpetuate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some people, <laughs> um, I think your boy mentioned it, you know, sometimes there's people that look like us, um, but really mentally. Um, they're, they're not on the same page, right? And so yeah, they're yeah. free or skin, but they speak um, as if they're white, right? And so we have to recognize that there's so much work to be done overall because of how, um, how messed up our education system is, 
right? Yeah. Um, to prevent us from really learning uh, about the full scope of people's identities, but um, discussing narratives that were perpetuated. Yeah, a hundred percent. And these things go really deep because once again, um, and I'm saying this more so for the people who are listening who might not be so hip to what we're saying, but yeah. just to make it kind of uh, simple. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Nyaboy was mentioning in, in the city symposium, uh, I think about halfway or a little after halfway the talk, mm-hmm. um, the question she was answering had something to do about uh, rewriting history and also questioning the history that you've been given yeah. and the cost, the perceived cost of that to many folks who don't want to let go of the history and the narrative that they've yeah. been given because of the perceived loss to their That's own, um, I don't know, I don't know what it is, that yeah. ancestral heritage or thoughts of superiority, whatever it is, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, mm-hmm. to speak for anybody here. Um, and just from my own personal experience, I feel like if somebody's listening right now and, and they don't, their only imagining of narrative is talking about who won which war and who, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it, again, like it's so much more nuanced and so much more baseline than that for mm-hmm. a person of color. Mm-hmm. Um, to go through something like this and and feel like uh, almost like you're being forced um, by your education system to be ashamed of yourself, yeah, exactly. to be ashamed of who you are. Yeah. Um, I have drawings like right there on the wall mm-hmm. uh, because I'm in the basement. My mom has put up a bunch of our childhood drawings. Mm-hmm. I have drawings where in school we were asked to draw our families and I drew blonde haired, white skinned, oh. white families. Yeah. For me, for my family. Mm-hmm. What is that? You know, that's that's self-hatred. That's mm-hmm. self-denial. Exactly. I am not white skinned. I do not have blonde hair. Nobody yeah. in my family does. Yeah. No? Nobody in my family has light eyes. You know what I mean? Like that represents us in zero in, in no way at all. Mm-hmm. But that's what that's just a very, very tiny example of what you were talking about, you know, the importance of changing the narrative. And, um, you know, I think for folks who, uh, for, for white folks, you know, who have never had to feel uncomfortable about who they are, where they come from, their name, their yeah. skin color, yeah. uh, that is a very foreign concept. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like, well, what's the big deal? Yeah. And that's why I think it's so important for people to feel uncomfortable. Like, if you don't feel uncomfortable, there's a problem. I mean, you're not taking in that information, especially if you're a privilege, right? Um, mm-hmm. And unless you've been doing this work and you've been able to understand, but still, it will still be discomfort, but it's because it takes you away from all that you've known, right? Um, all that you've known is that your ancestors built this country uh, and they freed all of these slaves and, you know, um, the indigenous people gave us their land so that we could build on it and, and yeah. flourish. Um, but you've been <laughs> provided false information. Um, and I think another piece of that um, is that not only is the education system um, misleading, you know, communities, misleading children, um, but it's part of a larger organization, right? Like it's not only the education system, but it's connected yeah. to other institutions. Um, yeah. You know, this connects to employment, this connects to everything that we experience. So our lives are at jeopardy when we don't know ourselves. And if you don't know yourself, then you won't know how to show up in the world. You're going mm. to show up uh, like your white brother, but then you don't get the same opportunities because you don't look like him, you know? Mm. Um, and so there's, there's so many, so many layers to it. Um, and again, dissecting it is really, really um, about dismantling these aspects of, of systematic racism. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And something I've noticed, especially with immigrant communities, is that yeah. in the workplace, you know, one of the ways that this translates over in, in the workplace or even in just real, real world stuff uh, outside of school um, is that <clears throat> when you don't know yourself and you feel, once again, either an unwanted uh, externality, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, to your workplace, to your team, to the city that you live in, mm-hmm. what have you, to your neighborhood, yeah. um, you're also not as likely to stand up for yourself because you're scared of the consequences, you know, of being shut out, of being fired, of being labeled difficult or angry, 
you know, or hostile because you've walked through life being implicitly fed these narratives about yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Yeah. it's it's, it's it's this idea that we all start at the same level, which we do not. We don't all start at the the same, we don't all have the same race. There's some people who, of course, white people who have hundreds of years um, ahead. And so, you know, this idea of equality doesn't make sense. Um, mm-hmm. Even sometimes I question how equity, and I'm trying to think of what else we could use to really <laughs> identify the experiences of marginalized communities, right? Yeah. Or minoritized yeah. communities. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just, there's, it's just so intricate. Um, the, I, I want to ask you though, um, you know, not being, of course, you're a person of color, but you are not black, right? Um, so, when the movement um, began in London or when, you know, when you, you were at the protest, what was the experience for you feeling that, right? And, and did you find a level of connection to the experiences of um, folks who were even speaking on stage? Personally, did I feel a connection? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I felt an understanding, not coming from a personal place, but like, I, I hear you and I, I understand the urgency and the seriousness of this movement and mm-hmm. of, of what's happening. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not to pat myself on the back or anything, but I'm, I'm not new mm-hmm. to the reason for why Black Lives Matter exists. Mm-hmm. You know, it, this is not um, as terrible as this year mm-hmm. <laughs> has been, um, especially to Black folks. Mm-hmm. I, I can't say that I was shocked, well, I mean, I was disturbed by seeing the video of George Floyd. I actually couldn't watch it. Mm -hmm. Um, I I couldn't really watch it. I just, you know, saw the, the, the setting and I, I knew, um, Mm -hmm. especially after reading everything about it, but I, I I couldn't actually watch it. Um, you know, I was, I was disturbed by it, but to me, you know, I've, I've been following this movement and I've been, um, I mean, I, you know the kind of music I play. I play a lot of mm-hmm. stuff from like the 90s and I listen to a lot of 90s music. And, and in the music that I listen to, these stories are actually woven into the music. Mm-hmm. Um, I listen to a lot of 90s hip hop too. And, you know, so these narratives have almost been taught to, it's almost like it's, it's been taught to me through, you know, music that um, w- actually belongs to black people as well. Mm-hmm. Um, hip hop belongs to black and Latino people. Mm. Um, and so again, like I, I, I wasn't um, uh, shocked or, or uncomfortable by anything that was set up there. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, I, I came very aware of my experience being outside of all this because I don't, I don't share that experience. You know, yeah. I, I don't share that experience. Um, but, uh, I feel solidarity, mm-hmm. you know, um, to me at, at the beginning of this movement, I was like, okay, are, are people finally starting to believe black people now? And mm-hmm. this was something that, uh, Leroy, who was at the March, who was also at your symposium yeah. said, and when he said it, like, I, just involuntarily involuntarily started cheering because I'm like that is the message you know mm-hmm. for me it's like that is the message can yeah. can everyone start to believe black people now yeah. yeah um because again this is not something new you know I'm saying I'm not new to it but this is not something new <laughs> yeah. and I think it's so important because um you know one of the things that you know I appreciate but at the same time um I feel like it, it might prevent people from truly understanding the black experiences when we say people of color and we don't identify black explicitly right yeah, um, yeah. because we do have you know similar struggles but the black experience is totally different right For sure. um, there's so many other you know aspects to it that you know other communities just won't experience or won't understand completely yeah. um, and for someone who is you know aware of these things right and someone who does this work um, and whether it's through media or through whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's so important that you, you mentioned that, that, you know, you don't have that particular experience, but mm-hmm. um, it's really about solidarity. And yes. I think that's what white people need to understand because they want to be able to feel it in order to be a true ally or to feel, um, you know, like they are part of um, 
part of this movement, but you don't need to truly feel what we feel. You need to understand uh, your privilege, right? Um, yeah. Recognize the oppression that's taking place. For sure, for sure. Because even, um, you know, we'll, we'll, society will hopefully get to this conversation when it's time um, about how, you know, colonization and white supremacy has affected the rest of the world because it's affected mm-hmm. everywhere in the world. But right now, right now is the time for Black folks to get their dues. Mm-hmm. Um, I think other what other people of color uh, can think about is for those who have experienced um, racial profiling. I mean, it's racism and, and racial profiling and things like that. In some cases, yes, it, it can be, you know, similar functions and, and similar kinds of things that are done onto you. But in a lot of ways, it's different. You know, like if you're a Middle Eastern person, things are, or if you're a Middle Eastern looking person, you know, there are certain stereotypes and tropes and words and um, behaviors that affect you specifically because of the way that North American society perceives people from that area, which is different mm-hmm. in many ways from how same, same said folks perceive mm-hmm. um, black folks, you yeah. know, African descendant people in, mm-hmm. in this part of the world. Mm-hmm. And it's not to start doing like a, a, a discrimination Olympics, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not about that. It's about, it's just about being in solidarity. Yes, you know what I mean? Aware. And being aware. We support each other if we're not trying to become aware, right? Yeah. I hear a lot of people saying, oh, this is not only a Black issue. Other, experience, other people experience this. Of course. That's why we're telling you that Black Lives Matter. Right. You know, if you start there. Then <laughs> exactly. We just, oh my gosh, it's just so hard <laughs> to have to continuously express this. Um, <sighs> because, you know, what I also appreciate about Black, the Black Lives Matter movement is that not only um, it was a started by Black communities, but it was a very intersectional movement to begin with. Yes. Right? Um, yes. The trans community, right? Um, yes. That, that was a big part of, of starting the movement yeah. um, and how that intersects with all these other things. So mm-hmm. um, there's so many intersections within that. And I think what is beautiful is that, you know, we also recognize that we're on Indigenous land. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, that's a focal point as well. Mm-hmm. Um, in order to actually uh, participate um, in the movement. And mm-hmm. so if you're unable to um, acknowledge that you're on indigenous net, land, then you're not going to be able to acknowledge that Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. right? There's just, mm-hmm. there's so, there's pieces that you have to go by in order to truly be an ally and be a supporter. So um, I right. think these things are so important for us to understand. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. right. That's right. Um, yeah, the, the leadership at the level of Black Lives Matter, um, just speaking on what the organization itself has shown itself to stand for, yeah. is so like, it's, it's almost, um, it's almost like mind blowing on, on how they can encompass all of this at one time, you know, like, powerful. huge props to the it is powerful, it is powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and people are going to, you know, find all these holes and all these issues, whether it's with the movement or whether it's with um, even being selective about what they stand for Mm -hmm. within it. Um, And I don't know, like there's, there's a lot of people in this world and it's hard to, you know, ensure Mm -hmm. that everyone is going to all fall, all run under and and hold up the same flag and, you know, Mm -hmm. fight for the same cause because, you know, some people might do so for their own interests you know mm-hmm. same thing with being allies it's, it's yeah, the exact exactly. same scenario might be doing it for their own interests or for the mm-hmm. you know the perceived benefit that they think they'll get from mm-hmm. showing solidarity with the movement mm-hmm. um were there questions about black lives matter forwarded to you for the city symposium um were there <laughs> i mean there was something that i was just like shocked when i read it but Someone sent a question and they said, um, they said, since when was um, being black a thing? Like that was, that was the question. Since when was being black a thing? Like, and so I was like, okay. Yeah. Um, and I think there are other questions around, um, you know, what's the black community in London? Because black people are diverse. So what's the black community in London? versus them being like black people being part of other communities. And so there's this misunderstanding or this this lack of understanding as to what being black even means, which I question because, you know, 
how, you don't see me? Like, I, I just question what this idea of you not knowing what black is, right? And that's a lot of the time when people say they don't see color, um, mm. it's not that they don't see my skin, it's that they don't want to see my experience, right? And they don't want to understand mm. what I'm going through. And so I felt like that's where those questions were coming from. Oh, I don't see color, I love everybody, so what, what does it mean to be black, right? Mm. Um, and yeah, so it, it was just interesting to, to get questions like that. But again, um, there's a lot of learning that needs to be done and it's not up to um, us to really educate everyone. Um, but rather, it's about presenting a platform for us to really um, speak to our experiences. Um, and if we do want to educate, then we do that on our own terms. But um, I think people who want to be allied or people who just want to learn more about themselves need to actively do the work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just uh, joining the symposium for two hours um, yeah. or going through the process, um, yeah. but it's intentional, intentional work and reading. So I, I wanted to ask you this while I was watching the symposium. Um, it occurred to me that um, there might actually be, uh, there may or may not be an intended audience for the symposium. Mm -hmm. So was there? And uh, or who was it meant for? To be honest, there wasn't an intended audience. Um, okay. We just wanted to have the symposium to address, uh, one, what took place on May 7th, and two, mm -hmm. to discuss anti-Black racism. Mm -hmm. um, so the questions that I chose, I tried to bring up questions that not only um, were, you know, would support people who want to be allies in non-Black communities, but also Black people who are trying to understand their position, right? Mm -hmm. um, understand their personal experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, it was really important to do that because we're all trying to learn about ourselves. This is like, although we've been experiencing this our whole lives, we're, we're all trying to navigate this life, um, mm -hmm. this world, um, in positions that are very, I don't know. It's just like, we're all trying to navigate. We're all trying to learn. Um, your boy mentioned something about, um, we're not that invested in racism because we didn't create it, right? right. <laughs> um, so imagine trying to navigate a world where people are mistreating you because they are racist. Um, mm. And you're just trying to trying to get by, and, but and, but you're placed in a system that's not meant for you. Yeah. So that's what we also wanted to address. And I know my experience growing up in London. Um, you know, my older sister when she went to high school, when mother, she attended Mother Teresa before the school was even fully built. Um, mm. but they, they rented out another school and it was running through there. But um, she started doing Black History Month assemblies because she's like there was a, a lack of representation, right? Mm. Um, this is like in 2000 and, oh my God, probably 2002 or something. Mm. Um, and so she started doing Black History Month assembly. So when I went to high school in 2006, um, I was waiting for the assembly to happen um, and nothing happened. And mm. that same first year, um, a person who was not white, but um, he was a person of color, but not black. Um, he told me that I was an N-word, a stand N-word because I was born in Egypt. Um, and the only reason he said that is because I thought he was cute, you know, like my friends told him, oh, she thinks you're cute. And he's like, oh, you're a stand N word. And then, you know, all of these things transpired. And so I'm like, first, I'm waiting for the Black History Month assembly. That doesn't happen. Two, people are calling me the N word, like it's okay. Three, I didn't really understand what the N word was. So when they said it to me, I actually laughed with them. And some white guy told me, he's like, no, you're not supposed to laugh. That's an insult. Mm -hmm. So in the ninth grade is when I had to go back and do my research. I went to my older sister. I'm like, what does the N-word mean? Mm -hmm. We weren't taught about this in school. How do the white kids and everyone else know about what the N-word is? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I'm mm -hmm. like, clearly, this is not something that is being taught in school. This is also being taught at home. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I, I was so... Um, so lost, right? Um, and, and understanding one, my identity and understanding how, two, the system was jeopardizing my identity and my learning, um, you know, was an experience that I had to go through in order to realize where I need to, to continue to um, push my learning and how to support my community in learning about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I continued to do these, these um, Black History Month assemblies. And when I graduated, my younger sister continued it. Mm -hmm. um, and now I know they do it at, at Mother Teresa every year. Um, okay. so it, I'm just so happy that that's part of, you know, um, the school community now. But I also recognize that when I was in high school, it was uh, a choice to attend it or not. It wasn't necessary, right? right. It was mandatory. 
Right. Um, and that's how I feel like our history is. It's a choice if you want to learn about Black history, but it's not required. Right. Right. Um, big ups to, to the sisters in your family yeah. um, for starting that. that especially at you know a Catholic high school, that's pretty big. Mm-hmm. That's pretty big. We didn't have that in our high school. Mm-hmm. We definitely didn't have a Black History Month. No. Are you from London? Or? Yeah. Yeah. I. Oh, I grew up in London. Yeah, I left for university. Oh, yeah. um, and then I came back just last year. But yeah, but I did go to high school here. And um, yeah, I, I do not remember us having one. I really, really don't think we had one. And then in elementary school, I think we had it one year mm. in mentioning, perhaps, and we learned about Martin Luther King. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was just about it. <laughs> I mean, it was interesting in grade 10. My sociology book had um, Bob Marley and Nelson Mandela. That was like the only black people we learned about. And then I was like, oh, Bob Marley, all right. You know, well, those are some pretty good yeah, things yeah. to learn about, though. In uh, school. That's impressive. Yeah, Bob Marley. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then um, Nelson Mandela. And I'm like, yeah. that's important. Yeah. Um, but in the context that we learned it, I, was just, I just felt like there could have been more. Like now that I'm older, I'm like, oh my gosh, we could have learned so much more and not only because Bob Marley's a singer we weren't learning about his activism we were learning about his music um and and it wasn't connected to his activism because of of course he um he used his music as activism yeah but that wasn't the context that it was taught in so now that I'm older I'm like oh my gosh they could have been so much more Um, yeah which is you know what the conversations are going on right now about how we could change the curriculum yeah yeah Mm -hmm. So um, what uh, we kind of talked about this earlier, but f- going back to the symposium and the questions that you received, um, what did you learn about, let's say, the city of London or about, you know, your audience, your intent, your general intended audience through the questions that you were receiving? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was like, I think I visualized or I was able to read questions in the context of which I understood um, Mm. that London was, right? Um, I recognize that London is not very diverse. Um, London um, has not openly, um, you know, had conversations like this. Um, And so when I received the questions, I'm like, okay, yeah, it's it's understandable. Like these these communities have not been taught about, um, you know, Canada's true history or about the diversity that exists within it Mm -hmm. Um, so I didn't feel any kind of way like there's of course questions that I was shocked by Mm -hmm. because I'm like really you just asked what is it like since when are people black so those little things that I was just you know I was a little shocked by but otherwise I think it was really important that people felt comfortable to ask these questions um, Mm -hmm. because then we could actually address it and I think I thank everyone who did um, because we tried our, our best to um, bringing them all together um, and have some some questions answered. However, um, like I mentioned before, if they weren't answered, um, it's really about doing personal work because that's what it's all about. It's not about mm-hmm. just participating. You should have, if you did participate, um, I hope, if folks did participate, I hope they got, um, you know, various perspectives um, mm-hmm. that they could apply to their learning. Um, mm-hmm. And I hope they um, gain some resources um, that they could apply to their learning. Um, but again, it's, it's all about um, the intentional work that one does on their own. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and I'm, I'm glad that this is becoming part of the standard answer for these questions, that it's like, listen, it starts with you. You know, mm-hmm. it starts with yourself because this is the easiest place for people to begin. And I think it's mm-hmm. also the, the simplest beginning for somebody, especially yeah. if they are a beginner to all of this. Mm-hmm. It's to ask themselves, and I've been asked this question, you know, I, w- I was actually asked this question, a few people messaging me, mm-hmm. and I was just like, well, just start within you, you know, mm-hmm. like I start within you and ask yourself, like, mm-hmm. um, again, going back to like my specific context, which is mostly music, mm-hmm. um, you know, people were asking me, uh, mentioning stuff about the kind of music that they're into, and uh, I was like, well, ask yourself, why are you into this kind of music? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what about it you know if it's if it's black music mm-hmm. what about it are you into mm-hmm. and how do you feel when you're listening to it 
-hmm. you know how do you envision and visualize the artists who created this music mm -hmm. and their people mm -hmm. um because you might say well i don't i don't actively do that no you might not actively do that but you probably subconsciously do so you got to catch that you know mm -hmm. and and see if it's something humanizing mm -hmm. or uh or maybe maybe not whether it's something humanizing whether it's something dehumanizing mm -hmm. um and uh, I'm, I'm sorry to ask you kind of a very big question <laughs> with the last 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, but uh, this, quite, you, you made me think of this um, a few minutes ago. And I'm going to try to keep it simple because it's kind of not fully form, formed in my own head. But, um, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, being a person of color, a non-Black, but person of color. Mm -hmm. um, and being a part of this uh, this movement, mm -hmm. um, I haven't spoken to too many uh, other folks of color who are non-black uh, friends of mine about this. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it'd be an interesting conversation to have when the time is right. But it's talking about um, intersectionality yeah. uh, between um, you know between these different kinds of cultural or ethnic communities. I'm not sure what's the right word to use really anymore. Yeah, BIPOC. <laughs> BIPOC, sure. Um, and, uh, you know, like, I think there has to definitely be a, a, a reasoning or uh, some kind of like process by which BIPOC, you know, other BIPOC um, mm -hmm. start to question again not just themselves as definitely how how have our communities or pe things that we have been a part of or family members of ours etc perhaps perpetuated mm -hmm. um anti-blackness yeah and also like uh understanding that struggles that certain bipoc face and it is not something against or something that you know the the fight for black liberation i'm going to call it black liberation because that's that's how i see it. I, it's not words that are used today it's no. uh stuff from like the 60s and 70s but i call it black mm -hmm. liberation the movement for black liberation um you know it doesn't take away from the fight for equality of other bipoc yeah. you know and in fact it's kind of one and the same exactly you know it's one and the same and like i keep saying like I have been saying in this conversation, you know, for me, this moment is all about black people being on the brink of getting their dues and finally getting it. Mm. Um, because it's not just, uh, again, the, the, especially here in North America, um, the system that has been put in place has been especially, especially harmful to black people because black people have been here for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and have been denied so much, you know, mm -hmm. since the beginning. But I think, um, you know, I think it'd just be, it's also necessary for other people of color to be at the table, you know, mm -hmm. and, and to show solidarity and to show mm -hmm. support because once mm -hmm. again, our, our movements are, you know, are supposed to be in solidarity. They should be in solidarity with one another. Yeah, I think you, you said it all right there. Um, it's very much intersectional. Um, and I think we do uh, a disservice when we try to, one, separate um, the liberation of all people from the liberation of Black people. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't want to, we're talking about more so North America, but when we talk about the, the Black experience globally, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there is a global perpetuation of anti-black racism um and you know even in my native country and, and what we experience you know in the arab world and all of that and the way that black people are treated mm -hmm. and so this is why it's so important for us to you know bring liberation to our communities because globally we're experiencing the same level of pain mm -hmm. um the fact that because we are black and that um you know because of of the ways in which systems have been set up to prevent to prevent us from um, feeling comfortable in our skin or even existing within our skin. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that us waking up every day 
is considered resistance is very sad. Like, I don't want it to be resistance for me to wake up. I just want to be able to wake up and just be a human being like everyone else. Mm -hmm. But I know that um, until we're able to collectively come together um, as communities, especially as BIPOC people, who are able to collectively come together um, and use our, all our power, um, mm -hmm. we could definitely shift the system. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really about, again, like I mentioned, everyone understanding that Black Lives Matter is a movement for all people. That's mm -hmm. why we don't need to say all lives matter. Um, yeah. to, you know, it takes away from the idea that Black people are experiencing what they are right now. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, you mentioned earlier about um, mentioning to people that, you know, it starts within. Um, and I just want to touch on, you know, Dobi Joki Personal Development, my service, um, and mm -hmm. why I started it. Um, so I started it one because personal development is really about uh, learning about who you are, right? And, and how you want to um, be the best version of yourself. That's what personal development is, the actions that, and steps that you take. Um, when I started Dobi Joke Personal Development, it's really when I was taking the time to learn who I was um, and in relation to what is around me and where I live and, and how I exist in this world. Um, and the program is really centered on People, uh, people of African descent understanding who they are. Um, and I think that's the, the starting point um, for all communities, um, especially black community, uh, black community members who are like, damn, like I don't know how to really participate and be a part of the movement. Like, I, I don't know if I could go out and protest. I don't know if whatever, regardless of what it is, you start at yourself, start at the core and really truly uh, begin to love yourself. So that's really what my service is about. And I think it's also a part of uh, the liberation of our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. I, I really love how you um, use such an important integral uh, knowledge for, mm -hmm. you know, personal development, for self-love, for, for just mm -hmm. self, you know, realization in life. Mm -hmm. um, and you bring it back to, to your community, you know, and, and to people because it's not, it's service in a way that is like makes a lifetime of difference. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for, you know, for, for folks who have had, you know, again, one thing that I have been saying some t in, in the conversations is that when we acknowledge that, um, you know, the history of African descended people and of black people is not a history that begins with oppression um, you know, that's something to, that I think, especially a lot of people who, especially a lot of white people, a lot of allies, people who are new to, to this, to these conversations need to keep in the back of their minds mm -hmm. just so that othering doesn't become cemented, you know, in oh, this, exactly. in a twisted way. But, um, but there, there still has to be the, uh, also, uh, understanding of what generational trauma is and does. Um, so when you want to talk about, you know, a few centuries of, um, the worst kind of, of trauma possible, that is slavery, uh, you know, that's something that the, you know, you're undoing generational trauma in the mm -hmm. work that you do. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing with, with folks like, you know, like myself, my parents come from a war torn country. Yeah. Um, we're from Afghanistan, which has been in war and in turmoil since the beginning of time. Like I have not, maybe that, maybe that is something, you know, new history books need to be written, but of all the history that I've read of Afghanistan, there's always been invasions and yeah. war and et cetera. And so generational trauma exists in that way too. So, you know, whatever it is, um, it's, it's what trauma is trauma, you know? Uh, and when it's done so heinously and so systematically and so publicly, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think non-Black people really, really have to honor that um, about Black people's experience. You know, mm -hmm. they, have, they have to honor what has been done mm -hmm. and more so what is the impact and what yeah. are the effects. Yeah, because, that's yeah, because that's, that's still ongoing, you know, because like, we, like I was saying, this stuff just repeats itself over this mm -hmm. generational trauma. Mm -hmm. It's uh, until it's broken. Yeah you know, in the lineage, it, it mm -hmm. carries on uh, very much so. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that work that you're doing, I hope you view it that way. No, definitely. And Go I ahead. think it, it, it's 
took me some time to understand it in that way um, because mm -hmm. you know the, the fight for me to understand who I was um, was really about me just trying to exist and trying to feel good about existing right mm -hmm. uh, like trying to support my community and doing the same so I didn't really put it into that context until you know recently um, but I think again it's there's so much work that we have to do and there's so much internal work that we have to do um, you know, over the course of our lifetime to, to make sure that we, we fight for our liberation. So I think, I think it's beautiful to be able to have conversations like this uh, because it opens my eyes to new perspectives as well, just the dialogue that we're having. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why that symposium was so good because I think it opened the eyes to so many people um, mm -hmm. about the different perspectives that were offered um, mm -hmm. and, and the fact that these things need to continuously happen mm -hmm. um, because it is education. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that folks saw it that way. Yes. Oh, they for sure did. And it was so rich mm -hmm. in conversation. Like the conversation was very, very rich. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that is, that goes a long, long way, especially right now where, mm -hmm. you know, don't hold back, <laughs> yeah. say what you really think and what mm -hmm. you really feel. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is very, very enriching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yes yeah and thank you I'm, I'm happy to speak with you Dobi Joki this is this has been really nice and uh, I appreciate your time and and all all of the jewels that you have to bring because you have many many to bring thank you thank you so much yeah so thank thank you awesome I appreciate it and I know that um, I love the work that you're doing at Radio Western um, and I think it's thank so you. powerful that we're able to um, bring these conversations in, right? Um, and not only during, uh, what's that thing called? All, all, all Black, Black Everything. everything. <laughs> not only during All Black Everything, but this needs to con uh, consistently uh, be on the airwaves, right? Yes. Um, you know, yes. these uh, Black experience, Indigenous experiences, um, people, experiences of people of color and other marginalized communities need to be centered and at the forefront. Um, and we need to become more comfortable having these conversations and hearing them. And the more mm -hmm. that we do that, um, the more people are going to be able to to learn about um, the positionality amongst all of this. So mm -hmm. continue to do your work as you do. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You are definitely one of the, the I'm not gassing you up here. You're definitely one of the big <laughs> inspirations behind it. Not only your hustle, but just the heart that you put in, the, the genuine love and heart that you put in your work mm -hmm. is, has been very, very inspiring for me. Awesome, that's so good to hear. <laughs> yes, <laughs> make, gotta make sure you know that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll let you go. I know you gotta go, you got lots of things to do today. But again, thanks so much for your time. Yes, uh, I really appreciate it. Yes, all okay. right, we'll talk soon. Yes, yes. Bye. Bye.